that we inherited. And that is an extraordinary thing. Again, I apologize to those of you who memorized the Magna Carta documentary or the speech I gave last time, but in case you didn't know it was going to be on the exam, I'm going to repeat a few things. <laughs> when, when I lectured American history at the University of Ottawa, which I do periodically, I read them this quotation about a commentator calling his country a land, perhaps the only one in the universe, in which political or civil liberty is the very end and scope of the Constitution. Actually, I tend to say more like, a land, perhaps the only one in the universe, in which political or civil liberty is the very end and scope of the Constitution. Because it sounds so American to modern ears. But it's not, I should really say, that a land, perhaps the only one in the universe, in which political or civil liberty is the very end and scope of the Constitution. Because that's Sir William Blackstone, writing about England, in 1765, on the eve of the American Revolution, basically conceding the American case, and believe me, the Americans had read their Blackstone, that England was a land of liberty. And although George III found this inconvenient and tried to do something about it, he failed. He failed in the Americas, and he even failed in England. They retained their liberty. And that's important because, of course, the British North America Act says in the preamble, a constitution, that we are getting a constitution similar in principle to that of the United Kingdom. And you might be wondering, what were they talking about? You know, they'd been getting into the champagne early in Charlottetown, obviously, they thought that. Because the British constitution is not all written in one place, whereas the BNA was, and the British constitution is not federal, and the BNA was. But the people who made our constitution on both sides of the Atlantic were not idiots. They were not unaware of this, they were not untutored boobs, and they were not drunk. Well, they were, but not, that's not the point. <laughs> uh, what they meant was, it's a free constitution. It is to preserve the liberty the English have enjoyed from time immemorial, in which government does not presume to treat us as children. Government does not plunder us. Government does not take away our weapons. So John A. Macdonald was an absolutely vehement opponent of gun control because he pointed to the British Bill of Rights. He said it says British, the British have the right to own weapons, and they do and we will enjoy English liberties. They were all very clear on this, including the British. I said George III failed even in Britain. During the American Revolution, at the height of the fighting, this motion passed the House of Commons in Britain, that the influence of the Crown has increased, is increasing, and ought to be diminished, which is exactly what the Americans were saying. They're saying the executive has taken over, it has tamed the legislature or broken it, and it is depriving us of our liberties. And the British House of Commons, which at that point was pre-Reform Act, was stuffed with Tory landowners, the most conservative monarchical element you could find in British society, and they, they passed a vote saying the king was wrong right in the middle of the war. That's an amazing thing to have done. It's an act of courage. It's an act of statesmanship. It's an act of clarity. And so this is what they were talking about when it came to us and our constitution. I'm really undone by my technology here, but... We shall, as I said, remain hopeful, keep smiling, <laughs> password as many times as we have to, and we'll see who rests first. There we go. Now, it was a fairly close-run thing under George III. He didn't try to steamroll Parliament the way the Stuarts had, abolish it, imprison its members. He tried to win it over by flattery, by perks, by jobs, by anything it took to make Parliament preserve the appearance, but hollow it out. And that is a lesson for the future. Because after the American Revolution, in the United States, they responded to this threat to the independence of the legislature by separating them entirely, by creating a Congress whose members could not serve in the executive branch. In Britain, they went a different route, but they took the problem very seriously. What they did in Britain was that they tied the executive to the legislature. They figured the legislature comes from the common people. It has always been closest to them. If we force the cabinet and the prime minister to come from the legislature, and eventually from the House of Commons, we will tie them to the people and nothing bad can happen. Well, in politics, something bad can always happen. Right? Yeah. It's, like, it's like golf. It's never so bad it can't get worse. <laughs> and what happened subsequently is that the executive 
absorbed the legislature, essentially. Instead of these ties in the British and Canadian system binding the executive to the legislature and hence to the people, it bound the legislature to the executive and pulled it free of us. Because ambition will find a way. The executive came down into the parliament and sucked it up after it, making parliament an appendage. The state grew beyond manageable size. Government does so much at such a rapid pace that there's no way legislators can scrutinize it. There's no way citizens keep, keep track of it. There's no way even the people in government can keep track of what they're doing. Those omnibus bills, nobody knows what's in them. Nobody. Nobody knows what effect they'll have, but it doesn't even matter because they'll pass another one in three or six months that will conflict with it or override it. And then all these regulations that pour up. You heard from Josh Sarish's disputes with, this, with the municipality, in which it's fairly clear that they don't know what their laws say. That's kind of bad. And in 1982, this is where it's Trudeau's mess, Trudeau Sr., we got this new constitution, it was supposed to be all grown up, because we had these liberties that dated from the Alfred the Great, and obviously that's pretty childish. But finally we would be adults, because we didn't, well we did keep the Queen actually, so I don't know what was meant to happen there. But this thing didn't address any of the problems that were really growing up. It didn't address the withering of the legislature. It didn't address the fact that government was getting too big, and too incompetent, which are two sides of the same coin, as a matter of fact. <laughs> And it excluded the people. This is one of the really horrendous, confused blunders in 1982. Because this constitution, which creates a judiciary and a bill of rights that can override acts of the legislature, this is kind of model on the American system, where the people write a constitution and empower the judges to strike down acts of the politicians that are contrary to what the people said. But in Canada, the people didn't write the constitution. It is absolutely, that's why I call it the unidentified constitutional object. It abolished parliamentary sovereignty, as we had, had inherited from Britain. It didn't give us popular sovereignty. It just left us helpless. We can never do anything. And that is undignified and insulting, and it undermines legitimacy. Americans love their constitution. Americans will, in some measure, die for their constitution. I don't think you'll find a person in this country, no matter what their political persuasion, who would die for our constitution. I don't think they'd even be willing to spang their knee for it. And if we come to a crisis, like a, a, another Quebec referendum, the fact that our constitution does not stir what Lincoln called the mystic courts of memory is going to matter a great deal. It's absolute nonsense from a constitutional point of view. And that really is a major issue. But how did we get here? Why did the people let this happen? Because we did let it happen. It, we were there at the time, and we didn't stop it. What on earth happened? Well, we need to go a little bit back into British history here, because what the British did when they strengthened their parliament, it looked like a good idea at the time, and you can see why, but it actually created a problem. Because as parliament became stronger at the expense of the executive, and without the judiciary in Britain having a very strong role, it became clear that if you captured Parliament, you got the whole thing in the bag. And that, of course, is what ambition started trying to do. There's a wonderful book, completely forgotten these days, by the way, uh, by Jean-Louis de Lome. He was Swiss. He came to Britain in the 18th century, and he was amazed at their constitution. He thought it was wonderful. One thing, he saw a sign on one of the king's palaces saying, trespassers will be prosecuted. And he thought, what an amazing country, where if the king <laughs> thinks you've done something bad to him, he's got to go to court and say to a judge, your honor, would you please get this man to get his money feet off my grass? And, and, but he, he really had a very deep understanding of the British constitution. And this, which was an inspiration, by the way, to the rebels of Lower Canada. In the Lower Canada Rebellion, Pierre Medard in particular, had read De Lome carefully. But he said, it's absolutely necessary to secure constitutional liberty to restrain the executive. Again, this is the lesson of British history, John and James and that whole wretched crew. But he said, it is still more necessary to restrain the legislature. Because what the executive can only do by successive steps, I mean subvert the laws, and through a longer or shorter train of enterprises, the latter does in a moment. If Parliament can do anything, then what protects you 
if Parliament falls into the hands of ambitious, grasping people, the kind of people who used to be gathered around the king, what if they're gathered around the legislature? What if they're gathered around the prime minister or the premier? Who or what is going to stop them from doing anything they want? And thus, the safeguards tend to break down. And that is what happened gradually in Britain. And it happened gradually, and it could happen, because it seemed for so long that Parliament was not a threat. Parliament was the answer to the threat time and time again. So how could you see the threat gathering in Parliament? Well, by the, about the turn of the 20th century in Britain, Magna Carta, though it continued to receive lip service and to inspire people, was no longer something you could bring into a court to strike down a law. And it used to be, again, and the documentary makes this clear. Edward Cook, when he's leading the opposition to Charles I, he says Magna Carta is such a fellow as he will have no sovereign. And when Charles II comes in after the English Civil War and the Commonwealth, he says, he's lying, but he says, I would never act against Magna Carta. Magna Carta had repeatedly been affirmed to stand above the laws in the same position to British legislation more or less, that the American Constitution does, though less formally. But, by around 1900, Albert Van Dyke, a very perceptive commentator, wrote, and he's quoting another Victorian commentator, if a legislature decided that all blue-eyed babies should be murdered, the preservation of blue-eyed babies would be illegal. But legislators must go bad before they could pass such a law and suddenly it should be idiotic before they would submit to it. And indeed, the latter part is true, but so is the former part. In the United States, if Congress passed a law saying blue-eyed babies must be killed, it would immediately be struck down as a violation of the Bill of Rights. If an 18th or 17th century British Parliament had done it, it would have been struck down as a violation of Magna Carta. It was, slavery was abolished in Britain by a judge. Uh, a, a British official had bought a slave in the United States, brought him back. The slave had decided he hated slavery. He'd run away. He'd been recaptured. He was stuck on a ship. He was going to be sent to Jamaica and sold. And his godparents stood up, got a writ of habeas corpus, and said, there's no slavery in England. And a judge said, that's right, there's no slavery in England. So English courts at one time did have this power, but it had withered. And it had withered because Parliament seemed harmless, useful in a crisis, and not itself a threat. But you get to this point where... As Dicey, again, quoting my friend Delhomme, said, it is a fundamental principle with English lawyers that Parliament can do everything but make a woman a man and a man a woman. And as you know, of course, Parliament can now do that as well. <laughs> Which is kind of odd, don't you think? Yes. <laughs> that not only that one should wish to pass such a law, but that, it, that, that the power would lie in a legislature. There would not be something more basic. How did we get here? Well, as I say, Gradually, the defender of the people's liberties came to be the sole locus of political power and legal sovereignty in England. And then, of course, the ambitious became MPs, they became prime ministers.